Stand to your feet out of love, respect, and esteem for the public reading of God's word. We continue our series, The Seven Last Sayings of Christ. I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, and here is the word of the Lord. Two others also were criminals who were led away to be put to death with him. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the Holy Scriptures. We humbly ask Holy Spirit, Bring revelation knowledge to our hearts and minds. May we receive the truth that you want to deposit in our lives today. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. We humbly pray and ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So here's the main idea of this series. As we are leading up to the most important week in the history of mankind, Holy Week, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, celebration of, of Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. I believe the seven last sayings of Christ are the keys to unlocking a life filled with hope, a life filled with joy, a life filled with great promise and potential. These seven last statements are seven doctrines. These seven last statements are seven outlines for a prayer life. And last words are important. Last words are lasting. Last words leave a legacy. Last words can sum up the entirety of one's life. Sir Isaac Newton, the renowned physicist, mathematician said on his dying deathbed, I don't know what I may seem to the world, but as to myself, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore, diverting myself now and then, finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Quite profound, I would say. Harriet Tubman, the, the, the great American abolitionist and political activist, American hero, She quoted scripture on her dying deathbed. She said, I go to prepare a place for you, what Jesus said in John 14. Thomas Edison, as he lay dying, Edison emerged briefly from a coma, opened his eyes, looked upwards and said, it's very beautiful over there. Last words, dying words. The last words of Jesus from the cross are a journey into redemption, grace, each word a beacon of hope, forgiveness, and eternal love. And what were the seven final statements of Christ? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, the doctrine of forgiveness. Today you'll be with me in paradise, the doctrine of heaven and salvation. Behold your son, behold your mother, the doctrine of the church and community. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The doctrine of atonement and suffering. I thirst, the doctrine of humanity. It is finished, the doctrine of redemption. Into your hands I commit my spirit, the doctrine of obedience or trust and submission. So let's look at the second statement that Jesus uttered. Today you'll be with me in paradise, the doctrine of heaven and salvation. It's no coincidence that Jesus died between two thieves. All four gospels verify and indicate that Jesus died between two thieves. How symbolic, how metaphorical, but how prophetic. That Jesus died between two thieves. Our precious Lord and Savior. He was born in a dingy manger with animals and he dies on a dirty hill called Calvary with two thieves, two criminals. Matter of fact, where the other gospels refer to these two individuals as thieves, Luke refers to them as criminals, perpetrators of wrongdoing. He goes a little bit deeper than the fact that they had just robbed people. They committed crimes against humanity that were deserving of the death penalty. And how apropos that Jesus died between two thieves that really represent the entirety of the world and all humans that have ever lived. Both these thieves, they saw the same man. One saw a sinner, the other saw a savior. Both offenders witnessed the same events that day. A man being crucified between them, proclaimed himself to be Messiah, who was subject to the mockery of the religious leaders, of the soldiers, and those that were bystanders there that were there for a sadistic form of entertainment that day. All of them mocking Christ, deriding Christ. Even both thieves, we are told, initially both were deriding Jesus, but then something happened to the penitent thief. Something was awakened within him. Something shifted, something changed. As he saw the events unfolding, 
he came to this realization. He responded to the grace of God that's appeared to all men. He responded to the moving of the Holy Spirit. He heard something, he saw something, he felt something. And when he heard perhaps the words of Jesus, of those that were mocking him that day, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, something shifted, something changed in him. He went from deriding Jesus to defending Jesus. He heard this plea of forgiveness and he said, that's what is missing in my life. Forgiveness, forgiveness from from God. And so this thief, both thieves represent the entirety of the human race. You see, the human race is not divided male and female. The entire human race is not divided by ethnicity. The entire human race is not divided economically. The entire human race is not divided religiously. The entire human race is not divided politically, left and right. The entire human race is divided between those who believe and those who reject Christ. Those who deride him and those who defend him. Two types of people. This penitent thief, imagine you're at death's door. You're about to breathe your last breath. Your body is racked with pain. You're suffering, and yet there's this conversation between Jesus, the crowd, Jesus, the thieves, and the thieves among themselves, all recorded for us in Scripture. And as one thief was deriding Jesus, the penitent thief said, whoa, time out, wait a minute. Don't you fear God? Don't you realize that this man is innocent? You and I are here, and we deserve to be here. Don't you fear God? Don't you understand today we're being judged by man, but tomorrow we'll be judged by God? That's the truth for every human being living today. One day we'll all be judged by God. And the reality is this. We're all identified, really, in this world outside of Christ as thieves. We're all lost sinners in need of a Savior. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all need to come to the realization that this one thief, the penitent thief, came to. Lord, Lord, remember me. You know, Judas was a thief. In John 12, 6, it says that Judas would skim off the top of the offerings. Judas was the accountant in the ministry of Jesus. He carried the money bag, the Bible clearly tells us. You see, ministries... Ministry is not cheap. Ministry is not free. It it costs something. So in Luke chapter 8, it tells us that wealthy women, wealthy women supported the ministry of Jesus financially. And Judas was the accountant. He carried the money bag. And it says that he would help himself to the money. Apparently there was enough that he could skim off the top. He was an embezzler. Judas, imagine, a thief stealing from God. How could he? In the Bible, Satan is called a thief. John 10, 10, Jesus said, the thief, the thief, the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and to destroy. But get this, family of God. In the book of Malachi, the last book of the Bible, God's people are called thieves. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Wherein have we robbed you? God said, in tithes and offerings, you have robbed me. In my former church in Albuquerque, which was formerly Victory Love Fellowship, now it's Legacy Church, I was on staff there. There was a wonderful, beautiful man that was our accountant. And uh, he was a jovial, older man. He walked with a limp. He was one of the kindest men I've, I've ever met. Be careful with people like that. He was a thief. He was helping himself to the cash offerings. There, uh, there really is only one way that you can embezzle. Well, I mean, people are inventing new ways every day, but he would uh, count the offerings and somehow he would be able to stash some of the cash he would help himself to it. Now, I could understand if you're, gonna, if you're gonna steal, be like Robin Hood at least, you know? Steal from the rich to give to the poor, I guess. It's wrong either way, don't get me wrong, right? But how could you steal from God? How could you steal from a church? Have you no soul, man? Have you no conscience? <laughs> and he got busted. You know, most churches have insurance so that when they somebody embezzles and they're caught, then uh, there's an investigation, the friends have got it, and they're able to ascertain, hopefully by confession, how much uh, generally was stolen, and then the church is reimbursed by, by the insurance company. So he was caught, he stole tens and tens of thousands of dollars oh, oh, through the years. <laughs> my dad, 
I, I don't know why this side thought. My dad, uh, he, had, he owned a bar, a restaurant and a bar uh, after he retired from working for Coors there in Albuquerque called Papa Toti's. And uh, he had this beautiful man that was a bartender. I mean, this guy was good. His name was Speedy. That was his nickname, Speedy. And he was the nicest man, the most jovial man. And, uh, you know, I kind of grew up in that bar, you know, and I, I knew Speedy. He was like an uncle to me. Come to find out, he robbed my dad blind. Stole. My dad had to install cameras, you know. It's hard to catch a thief. Don't you, are you listening to me? At the end of the day, a thief will always get caught. <laughs> but here's the deal. We're all thieves. You know, we rob from God today. Who would ever rob from a church, but yet we rob God? We rob God of the time that he's allotted us in this life if we squander it by not doing what he's called us to do. We rob God of the talent that he has deposited within our life if we're not using that talent for the glory of God to advance the kingdom of God. And then friends, for those of you that have been saved at least three years, for those of you that have been saved at least three years, you've been walking with Jesus wholeheartedly for at least three years, we rob God when we don't give him of our tithes, of his tithes and of our offerings. Will a man rob God? Wherein have we robbed you? God said in the book of Malachi, through your tithes and through your offerings. We're all thieves, we all need forgiveness. Can I get a witness? In the words of the penitent thief, they ring true to this day. Thousands of years later, 2,000 years later, his words echo throughout human history. Have you no fear of God? He told his fellow unrepentant thief, have you no fear of God? That's a message for America today. That's a message for the church today. That's a message for my life. That's a message for your life. Have you no fear of God? Where has our fear of God gone? We've lost all respect and reverence for that which is sacred and for that which is holy. But this thief, it's amazing. God's goodness. <laughs> if you're gonna, if you're gonna die a gruesome death, if you're gonna be sentenced to death, if you're gonna be executed, how merciful is God for both these thieves on their final day in this world to be crucified next to the Savior of the world? I mean, if I've got to die that way, I sure wouldn't mind dying next to Jesus because I know I still have hope. You still have hope. What, what grace, what mercy was on display for both these thieves, but not only for them, for the whole world. I was uh, at a pastor's retreat in Nowata, Oklahoma, 50, uh, 50, uh, 50 minutes outside of Tulsa. Pastor Willie George has a, uh, a ministry ranch out there, and he brings pastors out there, and he, they have uh, leadership development, and you know, Pastor Willie George, is, uh, he's semi-retired now, He's one of the top 50 pastors in the history of the last 100 years in America. One of the top 50, Willie George. Church on the Move there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, we were at the ranch and uh, we did some quail hunting in between fellowship and leadership stuff, you know. I kind of got this nasally thing going. I'm walking in weeds and grass, you know, carrying a shotgun the right way. It's got to be this way, you know, in this long line. And I, I told the other guys I was hunting with, the other pastors I was hunting with, I said, guys, if you shoot me, kill me, because my elder said, I'm worth more dead than alive. <laughs> Don't wound me. Kill me. Amen. So we're, uh, you know, we're shooting quail. The, the dog flushes them out. Pow. It, it's harder than you think, shooting a shotgun. You think, you know. Anyways, we did eat them. We did have, that quail's good. I said, this is better than Chick-fil-A. <laughs> but anything fried, you know, anything, anything that you batter in flour, uh, pepper and salt, and then you deep fry it, you know it's gonna be good. I'm, I'm sure rattlesnake would be good that way too. <laughs> well, we're out there, and why am I telling you this? I'm glad I didn't forget like the last service. <laughs> I'll tell you why. So we're sitting talking, and uh, these couple, couple of guys that, were, that I met for like the first time, they say, hey, we got a question. They're, they're elders of another church. So we got a question for you. He said, uh, we were having this conversation. Can somebody live a, a sinful life and then just moments away, moments away, can they repent and go to heaven? I said, absolutely. I said, the, the thief on the cross that died next to Jesus, he said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, would you remember me? And she said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. I go, that was fast. They didn't know I was just, had just worked on that sermon. I was going to preach it this weekend. <laughs> they said, we should have thought of that. 
It's not too late until it's too late. It's not too late until you have breathed your last breath and you leave this world unrepentant. And then for you, it's not too late. But this penitent thief, he said, remember me. That's a prayer, remember me, help me, deliver me. You know, in the Old Testament, when God remembered individuals, he delivered them, he rescued them. Genesis 8, 1, God remembered Noah and he saved him in the flood, from the flood. In Genesis 19, 29, God remembered Abraham and therefore he spared his nephew Lot from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. In Genesis 30, verse 22, God remembered Rachel and he opened up her womb so she could have a child. In Exodus 2, 24, God remembered his covenant with Abraham and therefore he delivered the Israelites out of 400 plus years of slavery in Egypt. And the criminal that was crucified next to Jesus, he makes this plea, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, Lord, will you remember me? His request was a plea for salvation. Two criminals, two responses. The question for you is, which thief are you? I pray that all of us are the penitent thief. Now when it comes to Jesus, love him or hate him, but you cannot be indifferent to him. The life of Christ, regardless of one's religious or spiritual beliefs, commands, demands a definitive reaction, one of devotion or one of rejection, but not indifference. This is because the significant impact that Jesus Christ has had on history and on culture and the personal faith of billions of people around the world. His life, his teachings require a decision. Notable Christian apologist C.S. Lewis famously argued a similar point in a different form with his liar lunatic lord trilemma. And Lewis suggested that Jesus does not leave room, he does not leave open the option for us to consider him merely a great moral teacher, philosopher, or even a good prophet. Every religion in the world has to do something with Jesus. You can, he's undeniable. This, the greatest of historical figures that's ever lived, Jesus Christ, never traveled beyond 200 miles, never wrote a book, never, never recorded a song. And yet his life has touched hundreds of millions Nations have risen and fallen because of this one life, Jesus Christ. What will you do with him? The Hindus say he's just one of, a, one of the other deities that we worship. The Muslims say he's a good prophet. The Jews say he's a, a prophet. The Jehovah Witnesses, they say, and the Mormons say he's a brother of Satan. Every religion, false religion, has to do something with Jesus. But Jesus asked his disciples one day, who do you say that I, the son of man, am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, Messiah, the anointed one. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus said, oh, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And upon this confession, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. <laughs> Who is Jesus Christ to you? So C.S. Lewis, he argues, he's either liar, lunatic, or Lord. His life requires a decision and he's one or the other. Listen, if you came up to me today and introduced yourself and said, I want to meet you, and I said, well, hi, I'm, I'm Carl Toady. And you said, well, hello, I'm, I'm God. I would think, you're crazy. <laughs> or you're the most deceitful con man that's ever lived. You are the biggest liar. Because if you... If you know you're not, but you say you are, you're a liar, you're a con man. But if you truly believe you're the savior of the world, friend, you need help. I'm just saying, right? <laughs> you're, either, you're either a lunatic or you're a liar. Jesus claimed to be God. So what are you gonna do with that, friend? Those that may be agnostics, those of you that may be atheists, what will you do with that? The most controversial figure in human history, Jesus Christ declared himself to be God in human form. And that now necessitates on your behalf a decision. Either he, either he is the biggest con man that's ever lived or he's the craziest man that's ever lived and he's pulling the wool over literally tens of millions of lives over the centuries. Or he is exactly who he said he is, Lord and Savior. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so the thief, the thief, he turns to Jesus. <laughs> it's not too late until it's too late. And he says, Lord, 
Not just Savior, not Mr. Christ, not Jesus. Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, Lord, remember me. I don't deserve this. But would you please remember me when you come into your kingdom? Mm. He knew Jesus to be Lord and he knew Jesus to be a king. And he knew Rome will one day fall. All the kingdoms of this world will one day crumble and fall, but there will be one kingdom that is eternal, and that is the kingdom of God, and you're the king of that kingdom. Hallelujah. And when you come into your kingdom, would you remember me? Oh, and then you got to love the response. Thankfully, here's here's what Jesus didn't say this. He didn't say, pal, you are out of luck because you need to be water baptized. And unless somehow miraculously we get down off these crosses and I water baptize, you can't go to heaven. You know, there are churches that actually teach unless you, now water baptism is the command of scripture, don't get me wrong. But if you're on your dying deathbed and you cry out for mercy, and you repent of your sins and you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, you are going to heaven whether you've been water baptized or not. Hallelujah. When the man said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me, Jesus didn't say, pal, you're out of luck. What church do you go to? That's the wrong church. Don't you know everybody that goes to that church is going to hell? He didn't say, Lord, would you, when you come to you, would you remember me? Jesus didn't say, well, first of all, I have a few questions for you. Do you believe in the Holy Trinity? Now listen, believing in the Holy Trinity is paramount. It's very extremely important. Don't get me wrong. But he didn't ask him that question. He didn't say, first explain to me the hypostatic union of the Son of Man. Explain to me your understanding of the humanity and deity of Christ manifested in the incarnation. Do you believe in the miraculous birth of me, the Savior? All those things are important, friends. But you have seconds left before you breathe your last breath. All you need to know, I'm a sinner, you're the Savior. I confess you as Lord. And would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Hallelujah. (laughs) And Jesus said, (laughs) Jesus said, to that penitent thief, he said, today, Not tomorrow, not a hundred years from today, not a thousand years from today. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. You will be my plus one VIP guest. Come on, we are going to a place of glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus didn't say, today you'll be with me in the Elysian fields. That's what the Greeks believed. He didn't say that. Jesus didn't say, today you'll be with me in Valhalla, what the Nordic Vikings believed. No, no, no. In the afterlife, there's heaven. In the afterlife, there's hell. There's nothing in between. Jesus didn't say, oh, today, oh, no, no. Maybe in a million years, because you're gonna have to die, be reborn, die again, be reborn. Don't you understand the cycle of life and reincarnation? That's what the Hindus believe. No, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. You'll be with me in a place of glory. Paradise, paradise that was lost by Adam and Eve and the sin of man in the garden. The word paradise in the Greek means a garden. Now listen, I don't have time to get into this. So I'm gonna do a second sermon that'll be posted online because many of you have been asking questions. Heaven is like paradise, but heaven is not paradise and paradise is not heaven. Jesus didn't say, today you'll be with me in heaven. He wasn't going to heaven. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, it says, as Jonah was in the belly of a huge fish for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And in the heart of the earth existed three compartments. Hades, the place of the dam, Tartarus, a place where a select group of angels are held in chains until judgment. All of this is in the Bible, by the way. And then a place called Abraham's bosom or paradise which was the holding compartment for the saints that died in the Old Testament until the resurrection of Jesus when he led captivity captive and they all are now in a place called heaven. 
Because that's where Jesus was about to go when he gave up his life on the cross, physically died. For three days and three nights, he was in the heart of the earth. He did some incredible things while he was down there. He, he preached to the spirits that were in prison long ago. The word preach, oh, I can't get into this. It's, it's not where we get the word evangel, evangel, uh, to evangelize. He wasn't preaching so they could get saved. It was a preaching of judgment. And he was there in Abraham's bosom with all the saints of old for three days and three nights until the resurrection. And he tells the thief today, you'll be with me, my special plus one VIP guest in paradise. That's what we're all hoping for, right? To breathe your, your last breath here will be your first breath in glory. But sudden death for the Christian means sudden glory. That although death is the greatest enemy to yet be put underfoot, Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave for us at the resurrection. And now we have an eternal hope. But what makes paradise paradise? What makes heaven heaven? You know, many years ago, this is when doctors used to do house calls. Many years ago, a doctor would always travel with his dog. And he went to a new patient's house one day and he got out of his, uh, his vehicle and his dog, his faithful, trusted dog, got out with him. And his dog was very obedient. His dog lied, uh, would lay down at the, at the front porch, at the porch of this man's house. And he went inside the door and he examined the man and they had been there for a little while. And, and the dog began to gently scratch on the door. And uh, the patient said, uh, that must be your dog. He said, yeah, he's such a good dog. He's been such a good dog for many years. You know, my dog has never met you. My dog has never been in your house. But my dog wants to get into your house because he knows his master is in here. And what's going to make heaven heaven? It's not the streets of gold, it's not the pearly gates, it's not the fact that your loved ones that have gone on before you will be there to greet you and to welcome you. What will make heaven heaven is our master will be there. Jesus will be there. And that's what's gonna make heaven a paradise. And the question is, will you be there? He's Lord, he's liar, or he's lunatic. I hope you've come to the realization. I hope you're as smart as that penitent thief, the one that defended Christ, not the one that derided Christ, the one that devoted his life to Christ. I hope you'll come to your senses because you have heard something, you have seen something, you have felt something in your own heart, and today you will turn to Christ and say, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, will you remember me? And Jesus will say to you, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And one day, I will come back for you so that where I am, there you may be with me. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we humbly come before you today and we thank you for the doctrine of paradise, the doctrine of heaven, our eternal home, all made possible because of Christ and his sacrifice. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, or you would like to rededicate your life to Christ, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. If you'll say this prayer with your own mouth and mean it from your own heart, Christ will come into your life and change your life from the inside out. Here we go. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And there's only one savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart, come into my life, be my Lord, be my savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love his grace and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Can we do that?